Gracious and loving God, we come now into your presence to commune with you, to have a relationship with you. Gracious God, make your presence known to us, touch our hearts and transform our lives. Do this, whether through me or in spite of me, for this we pray. Amen. Communing with God. That is the focus of our lesson today. Communing with God is a part of our scripture passage. It is not the only lesson that we can take from it, but it is the one most pertinent to this being World Communion Sunday. You see, communing with God is more than just being at a table. It, it means that we build a relationship with God and that we enter into God's presence. And as we heard from our scripture this morning, entering into God's kingdom or the kingdom of God is, is not just about what we say or how we present to the world, but is also about how we actually live our lives and what we feel in here, in our hearts. Our story today begins with Jesus entering into the temple. Now, the temple is where all of the most holy, the most righteous people in Jesus' day would have been found. These are the people who are supposed to be the most intimate with God, who, who should know God so well that they are able to introduce people all over the world to God. And Jesus enters in and he begins to teach. And the first thing that these holy and righteous people do and say is they come up to him and say, by what authority do you do these things? Now I have to question how holy and righteous, how well connected these people are to God if they can't even recognize Him when He's standing there in the flesh before them. These Pharisees and Sadducees, these priests and scribes, they, they can't recognize Jesus as God. And they question how he is doing the things that he's doing, by, by whose power, by, by what entity do you think that you have the right to do this? And Jesus tells them, frankly, I, I will answer your question if, if you'll answer one of mine. What is the source of John's baptism? Is it from heaven or is it from men? Now, these priests, these holy and righteous persons, rejected John. And so they begin to talk among themselves, and if they say that John's baptism is from heaven, well, then it's like they're admitting that they were wrong. That, that they may not hold all the authority over what is God and what is not God. By admitting that John's baptism comes from heaven, they admit that they may have made a mistake. And the priests were not the kind of people who admitted that they made mistakes. No, in fact, they were the people who were perfect in the eyes of the world and in their own eyes. A mistake is not within their view of who they are. And so they reason that we probably should answer that it came from men. This would be would coincide with their worldview. It would suggest that they were right all along and that John the Baptist was just some crazy man out in the middle of the Jordan River wilderness and, and that he's irrelevant. But the problem with that is that their righteousness, their holiness, all of these things they want the world to see them as, 
get them a VIP status <laughs> with the people. They get invited to the fanciest parties and the best dinners. And when they are there, they are the honored guests. They get to eat first. They get the best and choicest of foods. If they answer that John's baptism comes from men, they risk upsetting the people. And even though they may be righteous and holy, that righteousness and holiness will no longer get them that VIP status that they so love. So clearly, they cannot answer that it comes from men. So they do the one thing that they have left before them. They tell Jesus, we don't know. To which Jesus says, fine, then I am not going to tell you where, what authority that I have in order to teach these things. But I will tell you a little story. There was a father who had two sons. He went to the first son and said to the first son, Son, I want you to go out into the field today and, and to work. And the son initially thought that it was beneath him or he had other plans that he wanted to do. And he said to his father, I will not. But as he reflected upon his words and his choice to not go out in the field, he, he knew that his relationship with his father was worth more to him than whatever the reasons were that he said he wouldn't go. And so he had remorse, and he went out into the field and did the work that his father asked him. Now the other son, the father went to and said to him, and, and said, son, I need you to go out in the field today and work. And this son, he loved the glories and the joy and the benefits of, of doing what his father asked and, and receiving the, the praise for being the good son, so to speak. And so when his father asked him of this, he said, absolutely, I will go, sir. But you see, when the father left his presence and the glory and the accolades were gone, he didn't want to go out of the field. And so he didn't. And Jesus finishes the story there. And he asks these Pharisees and Sadducees, which of these two sons did the will of the Father? And the Pharisees, they're right on it. They're quick. The first one, of course. And Jesus smiles. And says to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, all of those sinners and those people that you look down on, all of those unrighteous, unholy, regular common people, those people that you won't associate with, I tell you that they will get into the kingdom of God before you. You see, John the Baptist came and you rejected him in his righteousness. But they didn't. They saw God at work in John. And they came before him and asked to repent. They did what God expected of them even though that their lives may be not the greatest examples of a follower of God. In the end, he did what he expected. But you, on the other hand, you rejected John and his righteousness. And even when you saw the people going to him, even when you saw them experiencing the presence of of God, you continue to reject him. Even moments ago when I asked you the question, the source of John's power, you still choose to deny that John's baptism is from heaven. You rip, you fail to repent and come into the presence of God even now.
communion with God is not about our outward appearance. It's not about looking like we are the most holy and righteous. You can all wear a collar and a robe each and every week. You can run around with the biggest crosses on and claim to be the most Christian person alive. You could claim to be the greatest of the apostles. And if your life is filled with hatred or with arrogance or pride or selfishness, if your life is all about you and not the other people out there suffering, that no matter how many good works you do, no matter how well you present yourself to the world, no matter how holy you might seem, you will fail to experience the presence of God. If, on the other hand, you are someone who knows what it's like to be broken, someone who knows what it's like to, to have made a mistake, to have not always done what was right or expected of you, but who, are, who is able to acknowledge that that's who you are and where you are, and you are able to ask for forgiveness and to begin to change and begin to live your life the way that God asks you to live your life, then you will see the kingdom of God. The prostitutes, the tax collectors, the Saturday night drinkers, the, the people who are out there more concerned with the world than about God, who come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and who come to repent of those things no matter how far gone or how far off the path they seem to have strayed, the people who realize that they may not be doing it all right, will see the kingdom of God before the churchgoer who thinks that they are better than everyone else, who thinks that they are more holy, are more righteousness, who thinks that they are above and beyond sin, who thinks that their sainthood crown is already upon their head and that they are already walking on water. Communing with God is about having a relationship with God. It's about being in His presence. The word commune, in fact, is just that. I mean, think about the other uses of commune. We say we go commune with nature. It means we're probably going camping. We're going to be in the presence of nature. As a people, as a Christian, we are all about communing with God. And God is all about communing with us. He wants us to see Him, to be in His presence, to experience Him at work, to do His will. It's, it's not about saying that we're going to do His will or looking like we're doing His will. It's about actually living in to be like Jesus Christ. In a few moments, we will begin to celebrate communion. We will go through the traditions of communion. We will start by reciting the historic creed of our faith, the Apostles' Creed, in which we acknowledge our place within the church universal, the Catholic Church. And when I say Catholic, I really mean universal, not the Roman Catholic Church. They're a part of it for sure, as all denominations are, but it's not just them. We will celebrate our place among the saints, those who have gone on ages before us, as we recite this creed that was written almost 1,500 years ago. After we say this creed, after we express our place among the traditions and the ages past, 
we will give glory to God, and then we will confess. We will repent. Much like our first son did in today's story, we will acknowledge that we have not always done what God wanted us to do, but that we have an earnest desire to do it now. And after we repent, we will offer forgiveness to each other. We will reconcile it with each other, just as Jesus told the brothers that wanted to come before the, the God in the temple. He said to go and reconcile with your brother before you come and reconcile with God. And we will have that opportunity. And once we're reconciled and once we've offered our gifts, then we will begin to tell the story. The story of what God has done. The story of why and how we are able to commune with Him here and now, this very day. And not only are we communing with Him, but people all over the world, our brothers and sisters all around the world will be communing with Him in a few moments, as well as all the saints in heaven who are sitting at His heavenly banquet and communing with us. We will tell that story. And then we'll be invited to come forward to God's table and to share the simplest of meals with Him. The simplest of meals and yet the meal in which we allow God's presence to come and dwell within us in our lives. We allow the power, the love, the glory, the Spirit of God to come and be a part of us. For we all partake of one loaf. We are all part of one body, which is part of one God. We are all redeemed by one blood, which was shed by one God. And we will be one as we sit at that table, as we are there in God's presence, communing with Him and with all the saints everywhere. I ask that you open up your hearts to be ready to receive his presence and to be ready to experience the presence of your brothers and sisters around the world here and now your brothers and sisters yet to come and your brothers and sisters, perhaps your parents who have gone on before. Amen.